called The Five, which is the uh, first biography of the five victims of Jack the Ripper. And I am going to be here with our special guest this evening, Dame Sue Black, who uh, everybody is really, I'm sure, very excited to hear more about. I am so thrilled to be interviewing her. If you don't know much about Sue, let me give you the official blurb. Professor Dame Sue Black is one of the world's leading anatomists and forensic anthropologists. Her expertise has been crucial in many high-profile criminal cases, and in 1999, she was the lead anthropologist for the British forensic team's work in the war crimes investigations in Kosovo. She was one of the first forensic scientists to travel to Thailand following the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 to provide assistance in identifying the dead. Sue is a familiar face in the media where documentaries have been filmed about her work, and she led the highly successful BBC Two series, History Cold Case. In 2015, she moved many to tears with her stories on Desert Island Discs, and more recently, she stunned over 300,000 Outlander followers when she announced that Lord Lovett, Simon Fraser, was not residing in a coffin built for him in the Wardlaw Mausoleum. Sue was appointed Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2016, Queen's Birthday Honours for Services to Forensic Anthropology. Now everybody give a warm round of applause for Sue Black. Sue, the burning question, what drew, you to, <laughs> what drew you to a career in forensic anthropology? Uh, it's very much about being in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> so um, I, I grew up in a part of Inverness. Um, my, father, my father was a great shot, um, and our, my maiden name was Gunn, which is unfortunate. <laughs> But my father used to go out shooting, and he'd come home with rabbits and deer and all sorts of things. And my mother was squeamish, and so it was my job to skin them, to gut them. If, you, if, if you're north of the border, then you grill a deer. Um, and so I was not in, in the least little bit ever, ever phased by anything that, that was sort of corpses and blood and such things. And then when I was 12, my father said, you need to get a job. And I thought he meant when I was older, and he actually meant at 12. At 12, you need to get a job because it's classic Scottish Presbyterianism that said if you're old enough to work, then you have to pay your way. And I, half of my wages every week went to my mother for board and lodging at the age of 12. And the, the job that I got and carried all the way through from then till I left school was in a butcher shop. And so I spent every Saturday and every holiday up to my elbows in blood and guts and bone. And, you know, it just seemed perfectly natural extension to go from the rabbits to the butcher shop and then in university I wasn't I wasn't terribly good in the first two years of university I find it all rather rather dull and pointless and then by the third year I had the option to dissect the human body and I thought it wasn't that much of a step to go from a butcher shop to a dissecting room it was just a different animal but it was the same process and I find it just fascinating and so from there, I was into forensic science. So I don't think I've ever consciously made a decision to do this for a living because it wasn't a career. You couldn't go to your careers teacher and say, I want to be a forensic anthropologist because it didn't exist. It really just happened naturally. And I don't think I've ever really chosen the career at all. Maybe it chose me. I don't know. It sort of evolved around you. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that, that's quite interesting. I mean, but how did you... I mean, initially it must have been rather difficult to explain to your family the field that you wanted to go into, or perhaps people who knew you, friends, um, you know, what do you do? And how, how did you describe that? And how, what were people's responses when you decided to make a career out of this? So my, I don't think my parents ever understood 
um, and, I, and I don't mean that in any sort of a disrespect to them at all. Their, their view was you, none of my family had ever been to university, so they didn't understand why I wanted to do four years in university beyond school and then three years for a PhD beyond there. And so my father's comment was always, what are you gonna do when you leave school? And that was after my PhD. And, and I think he just thought whatever I did, I was still in school and never quite understood. Um, my mother was a very emotional person and so I, I didn't tell her I was going to university because if I told her, she would have just cried. So I gave, I gave her about two weeks notice that I was actually going to university and she did, she cried for the entire two weeks. So <laughs> I, I went through my, my life lying to my mother um, so that when I went to Kosovo, for example, we didn't tell her till I was there because that way she could do nothing about it. So I don't think they ever understood. They, they were all terribly proud, but I don't think they, they were sure what they were proud of. Whereas my kids um, have always known what I do. And to the point that I've had all three of them at various ages in my dissecting room helping me out. And my rationale on that is that you, you, know, you need to be comfortable with death. It, it's coming, you know, just in case you thought you're different. You're not. <laughs> it's, it's coming and it's going to happen. And I wanted them to be comfortable with that. And all three of them are. And so they've, at various points through their teenage years, they've been helping me out in dissecting rooms. Well, that sounds, that sounds like a, a very healthy way of, of raising your, your children. Now, I, I mean, th this, this is actually, this dovetails very nicely with what I was going to say about my personal responses to this book. And I'm sure other people who have read it will have had similar responses, which is, first of all, it is an absolutely beautiful, gripping book. And, and what you do is you weave your experiences with death and dying, your, your personal experiences around your professional experiences and your scientific knowledge. And so it just kind of flows like a river, but there are times when I was reading it, I was feeling really desperately uncomfortable. There were things that I was kind of squirming about, and, and I had to ask myself, why is it that I feel so uncomfortable about death? Why are we so, we, what is it about us that makes death such an uncomfortable topic? Um, why do you think that is? I, I think there is an element when you're young and you're a lot younger than I am, um, where I think you almost don't believe death is actually going to happen to you. It happens to other people, it doesn't happen to you. So what we tend to do for ourselves is we project it into the future. We have this idea of how long we're going to live because we have a life expectancy. And so for most of us in this country, it will be sort of 80 probably, into the 70s and 80s. And for a lot of people, that's a long way away. But as you get closer to the edge of your own hole in the ground, you actually have to start to face it and to come to terms with it. Or not, some people do. But some people get to that stage a lot earlier than others. But most of us leave it until right the last day. And it's almost as if, if we don't acknowledge death, then maybe it's not going to happen. Maybe she's not going to come calling. Maybe she's going to leave me alone. She's not. Um, and, and people just don't want to acknowledge it. And I think we've also removed ourselves from death. So it wasn't that many generations ago when Granny died, she would have been in a coffin in your front room. And people would have come in and they would have sat with her and they would have held her hand and they would have talked about her and they'd have talked about stories. And we stopped doing that. We've medicalized death to the point that when somebody dies, the body's whisked away. And we tend not to see it again because in this country, the, the coffin lid gets screwed down. And we've developed a myth of what death is like and what it's about. And when you don't have the truth of it, you substitute the truth for a fear. And I think it's because we have a fear of it that we don't want to recognize it just in case it comes calling a little bit earlier than we want it. It, well, I, I, I think, you know, it's incredibly brave to be able to face death like that. I mean, it's something that I think most people just aren't comfortable with because we don't want to acknowledge our own mortality. And what you, you, you said about historically, you know, people were much more comfortable mm -hmm. with death. I mean, I know as, as a social historian, you know, children died all the time, people lived, you know, you were actually living in the same room in some cases with a dead relation as they were being prepared to be taken away. Um, death happened and it was, death was a part of life, but death no longer seems a part of life for us in the modern era. Do you think that 
that's changed, that removal from death has changed us in the Western world. Yes, I do. I think it's quite unhealthy because um, I, I have a, a, a dear friend who's in her 40s and has never experienced a close family member dying. And she's terrified. She's terrified when that's going to happen, which is likely to be to her mother. And she's terrified what, what, what's going to happen because she has no experience of that. And we're, we're all very happy when a baby comes into the world and isn't it wonderful? But we don't want to talk about when people mm. go out the other end. Mm. And however long your life is, even if it's a day or if it's a hundred years, there is something to be celebrated in that. And I think the recognition of death and dying is about celebrating life more than it is about worrying about the mm, death. Mm. And, and we don't celebrate the life until we're comfortable that actually the death is going to happen. Let's, let's ignore this fear of death and dying, but let's just get on with having fun today. And that actually, I mean, that's interesting because that's quite um, a historic response mm. that people had to the fragility of life, which was, I could be dead tomorrow. I mean, quite literally in you know, any other era, you could say goodbye to somebody who seemed to be in perfect health, and the next day they would be yeah. dead. Yeah. And we, we don't, touch wood, have the, a familiarity yeah. with that experience. No, we have an expectation. And whenever we were born, whatever year it was in, we have an expectation of what our life expectancy will be. And when we're shortchanged on that, we feel cross with somebody. And the very fact is a life expectancy is just a thumbs you know, what yeah. it might be, it doesn't mean that you're going to get to that age. Some will exceed it and some will not. And that's, that's just the way it goes. Nobody really wants to face that, do they? Well, do you know, I kind of do. <laughs> um, I think it's the last great adventure. I think it's, you know, you're only going to do it once in your life. So it's a once <laughs> in a lifetime experience. And do you know, I want to know what it feels like. Oh. I want to know what it smells like, tastes like, feels like. And yeah, you're not I'm afraid of it. No, you're not afraid God, well, of it. There's no point being afraid of it. But that's extraordinary. No, no, no. It, it's a great adventure. Um, so I, I, I have plans for when I go beyond that as well, So as you would expect. <laughs> so I'd, I'd quite like to get to a point of having the decision that I've lived long enough. And I would like to be able to take the pill that ends my own life when I'm ready, because I'm a control freak. And I don't want to have my children have to deal with me and... In, in dementia or in, in any form of a medicalization. I want to be fully compass mentis, my, my decision, my time, go. And when that happens, I want my body to go, I'd love it to go to my own anatomy department. Ah. So I really want to be teal embalmed and I want to be dissected in my own dissecting room. And at that point, hopefully the staff will have moved on and they won't feel too bad about it. But I, I think one or two of them might quite enjoy dissecting me anyway. <laughs> and then when that's done, I want them to collect all my bones. I want them to boil the bones because you have to boil the bones to get all the fat out. And once you've boiled the bones, I want to be restrung as an articulated skeleton. That so is that, extraordinary. Well, I want to keep teaching for the rest of my death. Yeah, that is that is, is that is absolutely amazing. I mean, that, I mean, I mean, yes, that is applause worthy. That really is. <laughs> <I'm sorry>. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I, I mean, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm staggered by that. I mean, it's so. I mean, one of the things that struck me so much reading this book is. Um, because you are so close to death, everything you do, you know, you're looking at bodies, the people who were murdered, you're looking at people who died in terrible, terrible, tragic circumstances. And the question I kept asking myself is, how do you detach from that experience? And you, you have a highly evolved response to death, which I would say the majority of us don't have. How do you detach from the grief of death, the, the sort of empathy around dying, um, all of these things that, that we as human beings naturally feel in order to do what you do, which is to be very clinical and to look at the bodies that you are examining and, and how do you do it? I, I think there's an element of desensitization so if you think about going from a butcher shop to an anatomy department, I think there is a bit of desensitizing. Um, you get comfortable with death. In a dissecting room, that's what you're surrounded by. So as a teenager, you're, you're surrounded by dead bodies. You know that it's not like the movies. 
They're not going to sit up and groan at you. They're not going to wander around like zombies. They're very well behaved. They don't move. They don't complain. So there's nothing to be afraid of them. So the fear of the dead is nonsensical. When you look at where we encounter the dead, then we're generally encountering them in situations where something has gone horribly wrong, whether it's in a mass fatality event or it's an incident of, of trauma or it's an incident of somebody has purposely taken that life. I did not cause it. I'm not responsible for it. I didn't do that act, so I don't carry the guilt associated with it. And if I did, I wouldn't be able to do my job. So as a scientist, your job is to find the evidence, collect the evidence, analyze the evidence, and present the evidence. It's not your job to find somebody guilty. It's not your job to put rights wrong or wrongs right. It just isn't. And you have to place yourself in that position. How you cope with it is that some of the funniest places I've been in my life are mortuaries. They are hysterical places. And they're hysterical because that's how we cope best with difficult situations. We laugh. There's a huge amount of black humor occurs. It's never directed at the deceased. It's never directed at the family or the situation. It's usually at each other. So if I, if I give you an example, in Kosovo, we had a young radiographer, a um, young military radiographer coming out. He'd never been out to anything like this before. So we had to do a little bit of training with him. And of course, we had a very, very, very experienced military radiographer who was going to put him through this training. And so we got a body bag and we filled it full of all sorts of rubbish, bits of wood and metal and all sorts of things. And his job using a fluoroscope, which is a live x-ray, was to scan the body bag and see if there was anything in it that he could see that interested him. And of course, as he's scanning it, he sees a bullet. And so that's what we wanted him to find. And we said, right, now you know where that is, you open the body bag and you remove the bullet. And so we opened the body bag and we couldn't find it. And we're saying, it's okay, it's okay, we'll do it again. So we scan the body bag again and go, okay, there it is. Now you go in and find it. And of course he couldn't find it. So by this point he's sweating, really sweating, because he's got this very yeah, experienced radiographer watching him. And he's got all of us standing around looking at him and he's feeling very, very exposed. But it's okay, you know, not everybody finds it first two times, but I'm sure you'll find it the third time. So I'll scan it again, look, it's still where it was. Go in and find it again. Of course, what we'd done is we'd taped the bullet underneath the table oh. so that you'd see it on the x-ray, but you were never going to find it in the body bag. And, and the, it just, you know, it lightens your day. Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, that is, that's as black as the humor yep. comes, I think. Yep. Um, that, that is gallows humor, absolutely. My God. I mean, it's... That, well, that, that kind of makes me want to ask the next question, which is, you mentioned in your book that you have a love of graveyards. Oh, they're fascinating places. And tell me why. Why, why Be in particular? Well, well, first of all, they tend to grow really lovely plants um, <laughs> because it's a very fertile soil. So that when you look at the flora, uh, if it's allowed to go natural in the graveyard, it's actually really a very beautiful place. It is, place. it is. Um, and the, the remnants of what, are the, of what is left there on gravestones are the people who are alive, it's their perception of the person who's dead, or it's their sentiment. And some of them are intriguing, some of them are funny, some of them are very poignant. And as you walk around a graveyard, you know, you, you see all, sort of, all, all sectors of life, which I find really interesting. And there's a graveyard uh, near St. Vigens, which is near Arbroath. And it's only when you go around that you think, goodness me, that person was 20. That person was 18, that person was... And you start to see a period in time where the profile was very different to what it is today. So it's a bit of a history lesson, yes. it's a bit of a, 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 a social lesson, but it's also a little bit of a, a, a glimmer into other people's pasts. It's a bit voyeuristic in some ways. Graveyard's yeah. a lovely place. There's nothing to be scared of in no, a graveyard. Not at all. I think no one's coming up. Yeah, I know, no one's coming up. That's what we have to keep telling people. When you're dead, you're dead. Yep. You know, there are no zombies. Everyone, you can stop checking your closets. There yep. are no zombies. There, there aren't. Yeah. Be more afraid of the living yeah. than you are of the dead. I think there's a lot Absolutely. to be said for that. Having said, ha having talk, talking about dead bodies in particular, you mentioned in your book there was this one experience with, um, I think he was one of the first cadavers you worked on who you called Henry. Henry. Yeah. And you had quite an affectionate relationship with oh, this cadaver. Henry. Henry um, 
uh, everybody gives their cadaver a name. Um, and and we, we don't know the person's real name. Um, and I've never known an anatomist or a student to give an inappropriate name to a cadaver because they form a relationship with the body. And it took us a full year to dissect from top of head to bottom of toe. And when you start, it's a terrifying process. That moment of trying to, to get your scalpel onto your scalpel handle and you're shaking and you know that you're going to have to cut into human skin it's a Rubicon that you can never recross. Once you've done that, you're in a very different and privileged world. And you know, this individual, when they were alive, chose to donate their bodies so that students can learn. And that's a gift that nobody else can ever give you that. And so there's a huge weight of responsibility as a student that says, the only thing I have to do is learn and I can't waste this opportunity. So you start off giving the individual a name, apologizing profusely because you're going to have to cut into them. And the cadaver is so patient and it's so forgiving and all there is inside that body is the opportunity to learn. They become your silent teacher. And by the time you finished a year later, you know more about Henry than he ever knew mm, about himself. That's extraordinary. And, and so there is a real, there's a genuine bond develops. I know that sounds probably very strange, but most students will go back into the dissecting room to say goodbye. Mm. Because it's not, it's not a thing, it's a person. And you never lose sight of the fact that it is a person, not a was a person, it is a person, and that person has got family and there's a responsibility that stays with you in there. And I've never known anything other than that in a dissecting room. It's a wonderfully humbling place, but it's an incredibly inspirational place mm. as well. That's, I mean, I, I find that really fascinating. There's almost this whole ritual of, you know, when somebody gives their body to science and then you use the body, and then isn't there usually some sort of ceremony yeah. afterwards. Do you want to describe that? So we, in, in Dundee, we had a funeral rather than a memorial service. So the difference is a memorial service, there's no body. Uh, in a funeral, we always had a body in a coffin representing all of the individuals who bequeathed their, their bodies to us in that year. And we can hold a body for up to three years. And that's a long time for families to wait for a body to come back. Um, and it can be very difficult for them because the scars have started to heal over, and the minute they come to the ceremony, it opens them again. So it's, a, it's, it's quite a sad place, but it's also an incredibly happy place. And we have this memorial service where all the family and friends of those bodies that were returning that year are invited. And all of our students are invited as well. It's not mandatory, it's up to them whether they turn up or not. We've always said that to them. And we always stand outside the door with our fingers crossed saying, please let them turn up. Mm -hmm. um, and they've never ever let us down. And whatever they do, there's obviously a silent communication across the years because they, they line the, the pathway up to the chaplaincy. And then when the family have all gone in, they line the walls of the chaplaincy and they stand. And the number of families who say, do you know, Young folk get an awful bad press sometimes, but these are young people here, dressed as smartly as they can, can I say, it varies, but dressed <laughs> as smartly as they can, but they're all there paying their respect. And they all know that what they have learnt from that body will carry them through their entire medical career. And they will always be grateful to that silent teacher. So you get that bond, not just with the cadaver, but with the whole principle of this is about recognizing a gift and being able to say thank you for that gift. That's, that's really remarkable. That's, I mean, it, I, it's also a great recruitment drive. Yes, I was going to so, say, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure getting a lot, a lot of people to well, sign up. What happens families come along and they go, just that's, isn't that nice, where can I sign? Yeah, um, yeah. absolutely. Well, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, you, you can there are very ethical ways in which one can use bodies for science. And then there are things that you mentioned in your book that you are kind of ambivalent about, you don't feel necessarily that comfortable with. And one of them is something called body farms. Mm. I'm not ambivalent. You will, Trust me, you're, I'm not you're, ambivalent. Uh, would you want to tell us about They're that? They're truly horrendous. So uh, you, you'll have heard about the body farms. Bill Bass was the first one out in Tennessee. And the concept is that um, at the time it was John Doe's or Jane Doe's, individuals whose bodies were not collected by families. 
they were donated to this body farm. Farms are where you grow things. Um, and the bodies are laid out in different places so that people can watch how they rot and how they decompose. And I have a huge problem with the respect issue of that. So, it, you know, do, do you really need to watch several hundred bodies decomposing? What we also know from the research is that any research is specific to that geographic area. So it doesn't tell us anything about how a body is going to decompose in a field somewhere in Scotland, because what we have is information on how a body decomposed in a specific contaminated area in a part of, us, of America. So it, it, it's come, become sort of almost tourist-like. Yeah. So people go on tours oh. around the body farms. Um, and I always say, you know, if you do something like that, would you be comfortable doing it knowing that the person that you're looking at was your mother? And if the answer is no, then you shouldn't be doing it. Yeah. It's not okay to look at somebody else's mother if it wasn't okay to look at your own. And so I think on a moral level, body farms are questionable. And on a scientific level, they are questionable as well. That's, 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 quite, that's quite interesting. I mean, there is... Obviously, there are lots of lines that can be crossed in, in science. Um, and you mentioned this kind of tourism around this. And I wonder how you feel kind of extending this, in, this into something like murder tourism. So like Jack the Ripper tours. Or um, now apparently they're starting a Moore's murder tour. Um, and, you know, can the public ever learn things from this? Or is it just prurient curiosity, do you think? Um, I blame things like CSI and those dreadful programs that are out there um, that whet people's appetite for this kind of thing. Part of me says, you know, if it doesn't hurt somebody else and it doesn't hurt you, knock yourselves out. When you still have people who are alive who remember the incident, then I think it's very, very different. So Moore's murder, unfortunately, the last mother has, uh, you know, died not that long ago before she ever got her son back. But where you still have people who remember those who are deceased, or they remember the families of those who are deceased, again, I think you cross a boundary. I, I don't think it's tasteful. I don't think it's helpful. Um, once you get into a historical sense where there is nobody necessarily left to be offended by it, well, good luck. But you got to ask why you do it. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, it, it I depends how, how long ago it is. I mean, there are, for example, um, descendants alive today of the Ripper victims, and, and some of them still are offended. But, and, and they have every right to be. So I have to admit, I, I was not sure what to expect when I was reading your book at all. And I expected to come out with the, the, the perception that this is going to be another Jack the Ripper book. And it's going to be another set of prostitutes. Oh, God, no, it wasn't. I mean, if you haven't read it, it, you really should. Because what it opened up for me was something that I had not thought about, and I'm ashamed that I hadn't thought about, was that these women who are victims have been utterly forgotten about in history. We've concentrated on perhaps one person and what their evil deeds were, and we've not thought about the consequences on those women, on those women's children, on those women's families that are more extended. And they'd almost become anonymous in history. And what you did was you gave them back their names, you gave them back their dignity, and you made people question that concept that we've always had, always had of almost just relegating them to the unwashed and the unclean and the unforgotten detritus of humanity. And I think that's a shame on all of us. So what you've done is extremely important, I think, for those women. And you need to keep doing that. Thank you. <laughs> Go and read it, please. It's fascinating. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I loved it. Do you, I mean, since we're talking about the Ripper, and I, I have to ask you this because, because of what you do, do you ever get asked to comment yes. about Ripper murders? Yes, and, because we do. Yeah, yes. and, and what are your feelings about people's interest so in I this? have been, I have been intimately involved with, with a Ripper case. So 
there was a gentleman called William Berry who left Whitechapel. He, he lived in Whitechapel and he moved to Dundee. And when he moved out of Whitechapel to Dundee, all the Ripper murders stopped. So it must have been him. Must have been yeah, him. Must have been he him. He was the only man who left him Whitechapel at that time. Him 499 other people. He was the only one. His wife went with him and he, he falsified the fact that he had a job to go to. And he definitely was a bit of a white boy. And two weeks after being in Dundee, he turned up at the police station and said, I've murdered my wife, I've dismembered my wife, you will find her in this box in this house that we rented. And the police went round and they did indeed find the dismembered, murdered body of his wife. So he was um, taken to court, he was found guilty, and he was hanged. And of course, because he was a hanged and convicted criminal, his body was allowed to be dissected. So his body came to my department and um, he was dissected. He had the most beautiful, and it really was beautiful, hangman's fracture. It was a perfect, <laughs> classic case of a hangman's fracture. And because it was so beautiful, somebody excised it. So we had all seven vertebrae from his neck that used to sit on my desk. And so it was, it was the ripper's vertebrae. And so I had of course a gentleman. Of course it was. Uh, so I had a gentleman who, who came to me with a, a television production company saying that, of course, there were stains associated with this infamous shawl. No. Yeah, nonsense. <laughs> um, but, you know, he, what he'd quite like to do is say, if this chap was Jack the Ripper, imagine if we could get DNA from the bone. And I thought, well, I've got seven. You can have one of them. So I gave him one of the bottom ones. And um, the vertebrae got sent off to the International Commission on Missing Persons, ICMP, who did all of the fantastic DNA extraction work um, in Bosnia and Kosovo and have huge expertise. And they couldn't get any DNA out of it, so there was nothing we could do. But at least we, we knocked that on the head, if you excuse the pun, um, and <laughs> said, definitely, you know, we're not going to get any DNA out of it. So if it is the ripper, you know, we'll never know. What we did do then, though, was fun. We decided to reenact it in the court. And so we had the original courtroom where the trial was held. We had 12 members of, no, sorry, 15 members of the public, because it's Scotland. We had a judge, we had two barristers, and we had a team of law students. And what they did was they presented the case based purely on the scientific evidence of today's standards. And he was found not guilty. Of course he'll be. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's really, well, you know, somehow, you know, I suppose we can let him off the hook and we'll only have to go through about, what, 499 Probably, others. Probably, yeah. But it um, wasn't William Berry. That's all we can oh, say. Oh, well, that's, that's that. I'm done. glad you've laid that one to rest. Um, I, since we've entered into the world of history, I'm, I mean, I have to say that, like, one of the things that I found so fascinating is the work that you've done um, on historical bodies also. And <laughs> you and I had this moment where we both realized that actually I had appeared on... We've done the same television we, we program. did the same we television program, yeah. History Cold Case, on, on the BBC. And, and actually, the episode that I did was um, about uh, a woman who was um, disinterred from the Crossbones, That's crossbones burial That's right. site. And um, she had syphilis. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about that case. She was uh, a young woman, and we identified that she probably had tertiary syphilis, which meant that she'd had it for quite some time. We suspect she probably contracted it around the age of 12 or 13. So she probably was prostituting, mm -hmm. was most likely. Um, and we were able to, to tell a fair bit about her lifestyle. Um, and then what we did do was we reconstructed her face. And we reconstructed her face as a syphilitic victim. And we reconstructed her face, if antibiotics had been present in the world, what she would have looked like without her syphilis. And I have to say, it was an incredibly moving moment to be able to look at the ravages of what a disease does and the thought that just a few pills of penicillin, what they could have made as a difference to somebody's life was truly amazing. We got a tremendous postbox associated with it because it really was... It was stunning, and Caroline Wilkinson, who does the facial reconstructions, very, very talented lady in terms of not just her, her empathy, but her science involvement. And History Caucus was a funny thing, because we had about two million viewers a night, which for Dundee is a lot, can I tell you? <laughs> and we had a, a very striking presenter called Xanthe Mallet. And so Xanthe used to get a post box that was at times fairly inappropriate, um, but she was a very good looking young woman. 
and she would get proposals of all sorts of things. Um, Caroline, who reconstructed the faces, she would get poetry because people would feel so moved by the faces that she had reconstructed. And all I ever got were, were letters from men in prison saying, can you please get me off? <laughs> and I thought, you know, it's not fair. No, it's that, not that, fair. That, that's, that's that not really fair. isn't, that really isn't Nobody fair. Nobody asked me out. Nobody wrote me a poem. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll write you a poem. Well, uh, th there, was, there were a couple of other things that came out from this. Um, one that I found so interesting, this idea of a coffin birth mm -hmm. and this Roman woman who died giving birth to triplets. And that, can you explain what a coffin birth is? So um, this was in Baldock and we're, we're talking about Roman times and she was buried in, in, in a position where her limbs were in, were in odd position. So I suspect she was considered to be unnatural in terms of her death. Um, what we had was we had a baby, uh, a full-term baby that was buried near her shoulder, which we assumed was probably hers. And then what we had was a fetus, um, so we're talking just about bones, found between her thighs. And then we had a third fetus that was still present inside the pelvis. So the likelihood is that because um, when you looked at where the second baby was located between her legs, um, the head was in the wrong place, it was in the wrong direction. So we suspect she suffered from something called cephalopelvic disproportion, which is where the head of the baby just wouldn't go through the birth canal. So the chances are that she gave birth successfully to her first baby, she then probably died giving birth to her second baby, and of course the third baby would have died when she died. But once you start to decompose, all the ligaments and the muscles start to relax and you start to build up a tremendous amount of gas pressure inside the body. And once that gas expels and her body was sufficiently decomposed, then that second baby would have been born when they were all dead, but just as a result of the, the gas explosion. So it's called a coffin birth because she would technically have given birth, although to a dead fetus, um, whilst in the coffin. God, it's extraordinary, and it's not something I would have ever thought about until I had read your book. But it is classic, when you have one here, you have one in place between the legs, and then you have a third one inside yeah. the pelvis. Extraordinary. I mean, Terrible. the dead can tell us so much, and again, what I found so fascinating about this particular chapter is the crossover between what I do as a social historian and what you do to historic dead bodies. And so why, while I'm looking at how people would have experienced life in a certain social class, in a certain neighborhood, um, with the jobs they had, um, you know, the type, the amount of food that they may have had, um, you know, their experiences of, of life, you, in what you find in the bodies, are able to confirm the sort of research that I do. And that is so unusual and so amazing. You've got to bear in mind that, that everything, from, from my perspective, if we're just looking at bone, it's obviously different if we've got soft tissue. Everything that you've done through your life, or not everything, but a lot of things that you do through your life get written into your bones. And so your bones are, are almost like a, a, a USB key in terms of you're writing information in there. The longer you live, the more information is in there that we can extract. So the more you abuse your body, the more you leave information for us to find. And there is a bit of an investigation into the body to say, what can I find out about this person? What can I tell? And we start with, with four basic things. The, the first one, actually a fifth, is, is it recent? Because if it's recent, then we're in a very different situation. We're dealing with police, and it's a forensic investigation. But police love it when you go, no, it's archaeological, because that way they can all go home. Um, and so if it's archaeological, it's technically 70 years before the present date. So if you think about that, people who died in the Second World War are now technically yeah, archaeological, archaeological. Um, which just doesn't quite feel right, does it? It's a little bit too close. And then what we look at is, what can we tell about the four basic characteristics of this individual? Are they male or female? What age were they when they died? What height were they? And what was their ancestral origin? And then you end up with something that you can put out for the police, that he's a male between 25 and 30 years of age, five foot six to five foot eight in height and white. And that starts to build a picture. But then we need to get down into the real detail. 
of what that person did to their body whilst they were alive. So what were they eating? We can tell that from the bones. What kind of dental treatment did they have? What had they fractured? What was their disease burden? All of those sorts Even of things. Even what sort were of they? jobs they did, like weavers. Sometimes, yep. Yeah. An occupation will leave a marker. Were they right or left-handed? Did they walk with a limp? Whatever it may be, there, there'll be information. If we can go and find it, then it's our job to actually go through each and every single fragment of everything, looking for any clues that's just, about life. That's, I, I, I'm, I wish I could be there and watch you do it, because it's so interesting, because it, it really dovetails so much with, with what I do. Um, I wanted to move on to something... Um, which, uh, you know, was really, I think, quite a, a kind of formative experience in your, in your career, and that was your, your experiences in Kosovo. Um, and, um, I mean, going into a, a war zone and looking at bodies of, of people who had been killed in the atrocities must have been absolutely and I just don't know how you could do it. I would find it very difficult. I mean, how did you... Tell me about this experience. Tell us about this experience. So I, I don't think I knew what to expect. Peter Vanessas, who was a pathologist, phoned me. I was sitting in my garden in Scotland, and he phoned me one Wednesday, and he said, what are you doing on Saturday? And I thought he was inviting me for dinner. Um, and I said nothing. He went, great, you're coming out here. And I didn't know what I was going out to, didn't know how long, really didn't know what I was going to do. And the British forensic team was the first team to go into Kosovo. And they had come to a, a little outhouse outside uh, Prizren, which is the, the, the second city in Kosovo. And 44 men had been taken off the, the refugee line as the refugee line was heading down towards Albania. And these men, and you're a man if you're 14, so that we had an individual as young as 14, were taken off the line. They were taken into an outhouse and they were separated into two rooms. Then a gunman stood at the door of each room and sprayed the room with Kalashnikov fire. One man who was closest to a corner managed to get into that corner and everybody in front of him effectively shielded him from the bullets. What then happened was they, they threw in straw, they threw in petrol and they burnt the building. So that man had to lie underneath the dead and burning bodies of his friends and his family, and he knew he couldn't come out. If he did come out, he knew he'd be killed. And the roof collapsed, so they were buried under tiles. Um, he managed to get out, and it was a very important witness against Milosevic, but he never got his day in, in court, which was a shame. Um, but he did survive, and that's what's important. With an indictment site for the UN, if there's a survivor who says, this is what happened, and we as the experts can go in and collect the evidence and say, this is what happened. And if what we say happened and what the witness says happened, then you've got a very strong indictment site. But bear in mind that we were coming in about six months after the event, so the bodies had been slowly decomposing in 38 degree heat, and the dogs had been in to use it as a food source. So the very first day, you're looking at standing in the doorway of a building. In front of you in one room, you've got about 30 bodies all collected into one corner, all badly decomposed, all burnt, all covered in tiles, partly dismembered by dogs, and just a boiling mass of maggots. And your job is to strap on your knee protectors and your mask and your double gloves and get down on your knees, hands and knees, and sift your way forward until you find the first part of somebody and then be able to clear around them so that eventually you can lift the whole body. There is nothing prepares you for that, mm. nothing. Mm. Um, but it's the kind of experience that makes you go home and hug your children mm. that much closer at night because you know then what's important. I don't care if the car gets scratched. I don't care if the hoovering doesn't get done. There are things in life that are just not important. Yeah. But your family are, and your kids are. And Kosovo teaches you the importance of family because we'd be standing at a graveside with a, a widow who'd lost everybody. And there's nothing you can say. There's nothing you can say that will make that any better. The only thing you can do is your job, because if you do your job, you collect the evidence. And if you collect the evidence, then you may get to Milosevic and Karadzic and Mladic and all of those who were responsible for what went on in that sort of situation. Gosh, I, I don't know how you come out the other side of that, because that is... 
I mean, it's excruciating. But you make friends that you would never normally. We always said it's a bit like Big Brother goes Balkan, in that, yes. you know. God, the gallows humor. God. You would never choose to live with these people ever, but they are your team members. And, you know, even if you haven't seen them for 10 years, you, you go into a zone with them because they understand yeah. something that you don't, that you can't talk to anybody else about. And that, I think, is, is the true test of when you're in a difficult situation. The military talk about it. It's this camaraderie. It's about being there to support each other. Yeah. And that is really important. And you must have experienced something quite similar. Obviously, it was a very different set of circumstances. But when you went to Thailand after the uh, 2004 tsunami and what you found there. Um, and did you find, I mean, what were the challenges particular to this this um, um, disaster? What you have is very fast decomposition. So we're always aware of where a disaster has occurred, what the environment is like, and what sort of a time frame or window we've got to get the maximum amount of information. Um, a lot of the bodies um, were badly decomposed again because of the heat and the humidity. Um, a lot had been washed ashore, so there was seawater damage, and seawater really does damage DNA, so sometimes it was actually really quite hard to get a full DNA profile. And because the, what people thought they were doing was, was helpful, they would take pickup trucks and they would go and collect bodies wherever they find them. So on the beaches or you know, in the houses and the gardens, whatever. And they would put them onto the back of a flatbed. And the flatbed would be driven into the cities and the bodies would be left at the doors of the temple. So we lost the context. We didn't know where they'd pick the body up. So we didn't know these were people on the west coast or the east coast or down by you know, a different part. We didn't know where they came from and we didn't know if they were associated. And the bodies were all laid out in rows because there was no refrigeration. So the bodies were slowly decomposing as you watched them. And we simply couldn't get to them fast enough to mm. get the samples out. And then what we did was we managed to get a hold of what we call reefers, which are the refrigerated trucks that you would normally see associated with you know, supermarkets and such things. Because our biggest enemy is heat. And if you can get the bodies cooled down, then you can slow decomposition. If you can slow that down, then you've got a better chance of getting the information about the bodies. What we find, though, of course, unfortunately, is, is these reefers are only cooling if the um, motors are working. And some of these were so old um, and so decrepit that the motors would stop working. And they then turned into ovens. So oh. actually what happened was the bodies were decomposing even quicker. So they would try then to, to, to bury the bodies, just to get them under the ground to cool them down. And the press then said what was happening was that we were burying bodies and not identifying them. Oh. So the press sometimes can be a, a huge problem for yeah, us. Yeah, a hindrance. I yeah. mean, and, and presumably I mean, the identifi identification of these bodies was just absolutely the most important thing that you could do because there were families wondering what had happened to... There are. The, the problem with it is that because it was a multinational event and if you have citizens of your own country involved, then your country is likely to send you. And so we were involved in both Sri Lanka and in Thailand. And the team who were in Sri Lanka found it very hard because once all of the... UK bodies had been identified, they were pulled out. And they knew there were still thousands of bodies needed to be identified, but because your government is paying you to identify your citizens, once we'd reached those, they were pulled out of Sri Lanka and moved into Thailand. So the politics do surround the situation, yeah. and that's often quite difficult yeah. um, for someone on the ground to handle. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna lighten the mood ever so slightly and ask you, ask you a question which I know um, probably a lot of fans of Outlander want to hear about to do with the identification of bodies. And um, you know that is of Lord Lovett, Simon Fraser, and um, not being the person in the coffin. Well, we decided. The Royal Society of Edinburgh does outreach projects and every time we've gone out and we've addressed a historical case. And the lovely Dan Snow um, decided that he'd quite like to come up and film whatever we were doing. And I had never heard of Outlander. I didn't know what it was. So it made no difference to me whatsoever. <laughs> but there's this beautiful mausoleum, and it's for the Fraser family. And 
it, it needs a bit of repair. And so what they were looking for was, was a bit of, of support. And we thought, well, if, if Outlander is so well known by all these very rich Americans and Canadians, maybe if we were to put a television program together, you know, it would help. And so Dan, we, we had the coffins, lead coffins down in the crypt. And Lord Lovett was the last man to be beheaded for treason in the UK. And there was a, a story that said, the, the Klansmen wanted to bring his body from London back up to Inverness, and they sent the lead coffin down for his body. And the government said, okay, you can have him. Then they went, nah, change my mind, you can't have him. And they went, okay, you can have him. No, no, you can't. And so nobody ever really knew whether they had released the body or not. But there was this coffin alongside the others, and it was the only one where the nameplate wasn't on the coffin, it was at the side. And the nameplate was Lord Lovett's nameplate. There was a clue in that. And so it had been breached at some point. So somebody had opened the coffin beforehand. So there's always a, going to be a contamination risk. And the first bone we brought out was a sacrum right at the base of the vertebral column. And Dan happened to be standing beside me and I went, well, it's, it's male and it's elderly. And he went, yes, we found Lord Lovett. And I thought, well, that's typical. One bone and you think we found the identifier. Yeah. <laughs> and then the second bone we found was another sacrum. And of course, you've only got one. <laughs> and what you get in a graveyard is what we call tidy up time. So that if, if bones are found and there happens to be an open coffin, you just pop them in. And so we had the bones of about six different people inside this coffin. But we did have the body of one relatively intact individual. So once we cleared out the detritus of all of the, um, the, the squatters, um, we were able to look at what was left. And we, we had, I mean, Dan had uh, at least a million followers watching it online. He was live streaming it. And we had the largest audience that the Royal Society of Edinburgh have ever had. And of course, we did all of the press beforehand. And everyone was saying, there's no way they'd have put this on if it's not him. There's no way they'd have put it on. And we strung it out till the very last minute. And I said, okay, hands up in the room if you think this is him. And of course, 99% of people put their hand up. And I went, well, you know, some of you are right, but it's not your lot. Yeah. So, you know, if Lord Lovett was a 28-year-old woman, then yes, it's oh, him. No. And the groans around the room were just palpable. Oh, it was wonderful. No. Oh, God, Utterly God, wonderful. Oh, God. Total spectacle. Total, total spectacle. And on that note... And he'd have laughed. Oh, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure. I'm, well, yeah. I mean, he's laughing from up there. Absolutely. Well, and on that note, um, I'd like to open the floor up to questions. And we have roving mics. And I see, it looks like a gentleman. I'm being dazzled by the light. Gentleman back there. If there was a historical character that I'd like to examine, who would it be? <laughs> Gosh, what a good question. Um, I like a good dismemberment, I have to say. Um, so, um, yeah, any of the murders that have a good dismemberment, I, I would have liked to have done, because there's a huge amount of information in dismemberment about the psyche of the person who is doing that. Um, nobody in particular, but, you know, I just... I like the ones that are challenging. What I really want to find are the bodies that we're looking for. So, you know, we've got missing people that we know are buried somewhere and we've gone looking for them. Those are the ones I want to find because they've still got family and I want that closure whilst they're still alive. And I hate it when we've got a body and we don't know who they are. So I'd like to get names for all of the people that we've had. So I'd, I'd quite like to deal with the more recent ones first before I get to the archaeological ones. Okay. Man in the corner there. Uh, you mentioned uh, CSI, uh, obviously, um, and there are others like Bones and NCIS and all of that sort of thing. If there was one trope in those sort of shows that you'd love to see the back of, or one aspect of what actually happens that doesn't get shown on those shows, um, that could be there and maybe should be there, what would it be? So the one thing that I'd like to do is I'd like to have a gun strapped to my thigh. As, as they seem to do, because I think that would be good. And then, you know, they seem to go out and they, they seem to have dinner with the murderer every now and again um, and be the ones that investigate the crime. If, if, as a forensic scientist, I investigated the crime, the police would dig a hole for me to go into. So they're, they're, they're unrealistic. But the bottom line is they're about, uh, they're about entertainment. They're not educational programs. They're entertainment programs. But where that becomes a problem 
is that young people who are watching it think that's a career I want. And it's so unrepresentative of the truth. So that when our students come to us and we say, right, you will be studying statistics. And they go, why? You know, <laughs> because you need to understand probability. And so it's a bit of a wake up call that actually there's real science involved as well as the story. And the other area that it causes a slight problem sometimes is in the courtroom because the juries think that they're forensically aware and the only forensic awareness they have is what happens in 40 minutes in, in CSI Notting Hill. And <laughs> at the end of the day, or what Val McDermott calls silent witless, um, <laughs> is that it's an unrealistic expectation. You won't get a DNA sample back in 40 minutes. It will probably take six months. So, that, so there is a, a bit of education sometimes has to get done in the courtroom just to keep it realistic. But I'd ban them all, <laughs> frankly. Anyone else? Hallie, thanks so much for presenting such interesting questions. Amazing to hear. So I, a couple of years ago, I lived in Bali and I met a really eccentric affluent Russian dude who had no fear of death. because <laughs> He was convinced he was going to freeze himself and, and wake up at another, another point in time. Is that, what does that mean? And, and are people dying and freezing themselves and are they going to come back to life like zombies, like we've talked about earlier? And what do you think about all that? Okay, so the answer is yes and no. <laughs> so yes, people are freezing themselves. Well, no, they're not freezing themselves. Other people are freezing them. <laughs> so um, when they die, it's a bit expensive to have your whole body frozen. So some people will have the head removed and the head will be frozen. Nobody's been brought back to life yet. And if there's a power cut, can I just say, you know, they're never going to come back anyway. So there is no evidence that, that cryogenics works at all. It's a wonderful money spinner. Absolutely wonderful. My view is when your time comes, go gracefully. Go gracefully. But no, don't freeze yourself. No. Okay. In the corner. Um, <clears throat> in your book, you talked about a gentleman who was uh, planning to donate himself after he died. I think his name was Arthur, and you told his story. Is he still in touch with you, or has he managed to donate himself, if you're allowed to say so? So Arthur is not his real name, but he knows who he is. So um, very, very kindly, Transworld um, took all of the audio for me and put it onto CDs for him, because he only had CDs. And so he was, because he's going blind now, so he was able to listen to the audio of the book, which was just amazing for him. He's still very much alive. And Arthur has been dying for the 15 years that I've known him, okay? <laughs> and it's always been, well, not make this Christmas. And ultimately, there will come a time when he won't. But right now, he's actually fairly hale and, and hearty for someone who's his age. But because I'm not at Dundee anymore, he has transferred the responsibility to, my, to the bequeathal manager, Vivian. And so Vivian is going to get his cryptic phone call. You, you'll understand what I mean. But she will get his cryptic phone call when that happens. His is the only funeral at Dundee I will go back for because he has no family. And so I will go back for his. But it will be three years after he dies. But the way he's going, he's going to be there for another 20 years. <laughs> so he's probably going to outlive me. God bless him. Okay. Oh, now people aren't shy anymore. Hello, um, what's your opinion on quote unquote shows like Body Worlds um, and stuff like that? Shows like? Body Worlds, Gunther von Hagen's. Oh, von Hagen's. Von Hagen's is an incredible, I think he's still alive, isn't he? I'm not sure. He was very ill for a while. Um, he is an incredible anatomist. Uh, so his skill as, as a dissector is incredible and his ability to trans form the bodies in the way that he does is incredible. I have a problem with it though. And I have a problem with it because I'm not convinced it's educational. I'm convinced it's a bit more sensationalist and entertainment based. And I go back to the principle of if it was my mother, would I want to see that? And if I don't want to see my mother, why would I want to see somebody else's mother? And what I, I had some very dear friends who are police officers who were in the audience the night that he decided to do the live autopsy in, on UK television many years ago. And what he was doing was he was pushing the boundaries. He was really goading them to say, you know, arrest me because at the end of the day, you know, it, it will make great headlines. 
And the police did hold off and didn't arrest him. But for me, where he fell down was that he brought the body in in a, a wooden crate on a forklift truck. And he took the body, which was frozen, out of the, fork, out of the crate and he sawed it in half with a bandsaw. That doesn't tell anybody anything. That tells you it was there to shock. And when you looked at the people in the audience, they were all doing this. And if they're doing that, that tells you they're uncomfortable. Why would people want to be uncomfortable? So it's not for me. I have problems with it, but that doesn't mean that I'm right and other people are wrong. If other people do get something from it, then that's fine, as long as the bodies are acquired legally and as long as they're acquired with consent. And that's the only question that I would place. That's a really, really good answer. And it, I, I hadn't even actually contemplated that aspect of it either. That's, that's really quite interesting. Um, other people, questions? There's a woman right in the center. Oh. Hi, um, I was wondering what would be your number one tip for aspiring forensic scientists? What would be my... Number one tip for Number one tip for a forensic scientist? Yeah, for aspiring forensic So someone who scientist. wants to be a forensic scientist, yeah. don't study forensic science. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is there is no such thing as forensic science. All there is is science. The forensic bit comes from the Latin pertaining to the forum. That's where the forensis bit comes in. And uh, the forum was, of course, the courts of Rome. So forensic science is just science in the courtroom. If you want to be a forensic scientist, be a real scientist first. Be a biologist, a chemist, a physicist, a mathematician. And then, once you understand your science, apply it in the way that the courts request you or need you to do. Um, I gave evidence at a House of Commons uh, select committee a number of years ago where there were four chief constables being interviewed in front of me. And they were asked by the chairman, would you employ somebody who has a forensic science degree? And uniformly they said, no. We want them to be biologists and chemists and then we'll train them how to be forensic scientists. So I'm afraid universities in the 1990s and 2000s learnt that there was a market in the word, the sexy F word, forensic. Um, and as a result, it's an attractant to students. And by and large, there isn't the job market associated with it. So when people want to be a forensic anthropologist, what I normally say to them is be an anatomist, first of all, because we have a world shortage of anatomy teachers. And then if you happen to have forensic anthropology along with it, wherever you go to do your anatomy, you carry those skills with you. So that would be my advice. I think we need a question on Jack the Ripper. <laughs> I really think we oh, need... Oh, are you sure? I think we need a question on the victims for Jack. I'm just turning the tables. <laughs> I think it's just kind of lucky dip at this stage. We probably have time for about one, maybe two more questions. There was a woman in white here. Mike's coming towards you. Hi, perhaps you've covered this in your book already, or in both of your books, but have any of the Jack the Ripper women victims ever been examined forensically recently? No, because they were buried 130 years ago. Um, there was, there was a, a move afoot about a year or so ago to disinter Mary Jane Kelly. The person behind that was Patricia Cornwell, she had a lot of money. There was some impetus to do it, but I think people thought it was in such bad taste that they wouldn't do it. And, I mean, Sue will confirm this, but probably if a body was buried 130 years ago in a common grave, chances are you probably wouldn't even know there wouldn't be that much left. We have to ask, why, why would, why why would, would you, you exhume her? What, what's the question that you're asking? They um, want to find out who she was, if because there was some ambiguity about what her identity was. And what was. difference does it make? Well, you know, precisely. So rest in peace is, yeah. is there for a very good reason. You know, if, if there is a, a legitimate question um, to be asked, then I think, you know, exhuming fine. Um, but if there isn't, you have to question why. And I think for something that is so um, emotive, you have to ask what you would get from it, really. I, 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 don't, I can't answer that. This is your field. No, no. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I don't understand it either. I mean, I, it's the constant quest to answer who was Jack the Ripper. Mm. Um, if people seem to think if they can crack the identity of Mary Jane Kelly, that somehow there'll be a, a clue that will lead to okay. 
figuring out who the murderer is. Well, she, if she's in a common grave, the chances yeah. of you being able to find her well, in the common yes. grave is, is extremely unlikely. Yeah. Um, by that point, you're going to have, effectively, as the bodies decompose on top of each other, you, you get a fundamentally a primordial soup. Um, and so you're going to have vast contamination off the bones as well. So, so what you're going to take from it in terms of, of DNA, nothing that you can use. Um, you might be able to find a body of a woman of that sort of age, but you could never be certain that no. it was her. Exactly. Not in a common grave, no. Exactly. I know it's time to put that to bed, yeah. really, isn't it? Um, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, thank you both. Um, you spoke about the medicalization of death and how, as a society, we've turned that way. Um, do you believe there's anything we can do to kind of reverse that, or do you feel like it's too far gone at this point? Um, I think it's very personal. Uh, and the whole point is the way you live your life, the way you die, I think is very personal. So I can only talk about my own. Um, my youngest daughter is 22, and the last time I went to my GP was when I was pregnant with her. And my rationale for that is that a GP is trained to find something wrong with you. And so if I go and visit them, so, uh, you know, if I, I've, I've been very lucky in terms of my health. I've not needed to go and seek their help. But if I go and see them, they'll find something wrong with me. Um, and I don't want to know because I don't want to live my life medicalized. My job was to live long enough for my children to become adults and independent. I've done that. So my job's done. And I want to be able to experience non-medicalization, and it's just right for me. Trust me, I've, I've had my illnesses in the past, and somebody once said to me, well, it's clear that you know, you've never been close to death. Well, actually, yeah, I have personally very, very many times. And so it's my choice not to go to the GP, because I've not needed to, but I also don't want to find. What are they gonna tell me? I'm overweight, gee whiz, you know. You think I didn't notice last time I looked in the mirror. Um, you know, so, so I know what's coming, and I want to deal with it my way. I don't want it done any other way. I would like to think that we will get to a point somewhere soon that we can be a mature enough society that people can choose when they want to end their own life in a way that means you don't have to do something traumatic like take an overdose or open an artery or jump in front of a train. The very fact that people feel that's the only way they can exit their life tells us that something is wrong in our mature discussion. It's absolutely not right for everybody, and that's the most important thing. But individually, I feel we should have the choice to be able to do it in a way that's dignified and appropriate and when we're ready. A lot of people who talk about going out to Dignitas and, and what they call the death tourism, which is a dreadful phrase, they go out there before they need to, because they have to be fit enough and well enough to travel. And so it's almost as if they're, they're ending their life before they're ready. I'd like to be able to end mine when I'm ready. And I think there are a few, quite a few other people feel the same, but I absolutely understand the arguments against it. And if it's not right for everyone, then let them have their choice as well. But we need to be more mature. Thank you. Sue, I could talk to you forever. <laughs> And I think everybody in here probably feels exactly the same way. There just seems like there's so much more, so many more questions I'm sure all of us want to ask. But I wanted to thank all of you for coming tonight and for being such a wonderful audience. And a round of applause for Sue Black. <laughs> <laughs>